Thank you, team. Today, we're going to move away from the Roman series, and we'll come back to that in January after our anniversary service. Uh, as you, if you've been here long enough, you know that we go to First Peter for that anniversary service uh, each year. Uh, and so the Sunday following that, we'll go back to Romans. Um, but until then, we're in the Advent season, as I mentioned, and if you know much about or have been in the church long enough, you are familiar with the uh, Advent season. That is the start of the liturgical year, calendar year, for the church. And it is a time when um, Christian denominations uh, look towards two things. One is the first coming of Christ, the birth child uh, in Bethlehem. And then secondly uh, is the second coming. And so we anticipate and prepare for both of those comings uh, as this church year uh, begins. So I'm going to do something a little different this year than I've done in the past. I'm going to use the word Advent and use the letters of Advent uh, for the sermons as I preach all the way through December 26, which is the Sunday following uh, Christmas Day. And using those letters, I hope that the words that I've chosen will help you to just kind of solidify in your mind what Christ has done, his coming into the world, how it affects us. So I hope that um, you will kind of remember these words and, and maybe file them away. And as you think about Advent this year, maybe these uh, different words uh, over this uh, month of sermons uh, will bring Christ and the Christ child and his second coming to mind. So the, the first word is adventure. Now, some of you are saying, well, wait a minute. Advent is an adventure. Why didn't you just use that and you're done and we could just be done for the rest of the, you know, sermon series for Advent? Well, I didn't want to do that. Uh, so we're just going to use, and you can see it underlined, uh, the A and the D in adventure. And so uh, the other parts or letters of Advent will be used throughout the rest of this uh, sermon series. So, adventure, you got to keep that word in mind today. If you've got your scriptures, if you want to follow along, I'm going to be in the Old Testament passage and a New Testament passage. The Old Testament passage is Jeremiah 33, and I'm going to read verses 14 and 15. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I spoke, have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days, at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth, and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. Now, you may want to keep your finger there if you have your Bible, because we're going to also come back to that 16th verse. I'm not going to read it right now. But we're going to flip over to Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 26 and reading through 38. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him, name him Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I'm a virgin? 
And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For, this, for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative, Elizabeth, has also conceived a son in her old age. And she, who was called barren, is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth, mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you are our strength and our redeemer. I pray, Father, that you would illuminate our hearts and minds this morning for what you would hold for us through this, your holy word. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. So adventure. The adventure for us often can be thrilling. It can be exciting. Uh, it can be breathtaking. And, and just moving in our life. All of us like adventure because it makes us feel good, but it also can be risky. It can uh, be indecisive, daring. It can have uncertainty as you set out on an adventure. You may not know exactly where that adventure may lead you. You may have plans. You may have figured that I'm going to go and do this, and here's how I'm going to get there. And then all of a sudden, that adventure takes a twist, takes a turn. It takes a direction that maybe you didn't think about. But we all, in our own way, love adventure. I remember growing up on the farm, every day was an adventure. <laughs> There was so many things to do and so many things to take care of. And I remember even as a, a young child uh, playing with toys, and my toys were trucks and tractors, and uh, just having an imagination of that day of maybe where I was, someplace else, doing something. Adventure is something we all look forward to those twists and turns. It takes us to places we didn't know we would go, meeting people we didn't know we would meet, doing things we never thought we would do. A venture. We all have a little bit of that inside of us. At some point in our life, if you and I, and I am, a believer in Jesus Christ, at some point you began an adventure with Christ. Now, some have specific dates. I can remember my date is April the 24th, 1973. I gave my life to Christ. I can tell you everything about um, that, that day in my life. And some of you will say, well, wait a minute, Marty. I can't remember when I wasn't a follower of Jesus Christ. I, I remember growing up in the church. I remember uh, just just... Christ was my Savior. But even in that adventure, even in that time that maybe you don't have that specific event or that specific time, and that's okay, it doesn't make your salvation and your coming to Christ any less valuable to God. But there is a point in that walk, there's some point where you realize that you as a follower of Jesus Christ you were different than the world. There was things that the world was doing that didn't sit well with you in your spirit. Um, you had submitted Christ as Lord and Savior, and so you were different than the rest of the world. You recognized something inside of you. And the, and the adventure began, walking with Christ as your Lord. Now, in Scripture, we often will point to the Gospels. 
And we will say, here God has revealed to us the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the announcement of the coming of this adventure with Christ actually began in the Old Testament scriptures, the Old Testament prophecies. And so the announcement of this coming we find in Genesis 3.15 as God announces that there will be a Redeemer. In Psalm 2 and 22, in Daniel and Isaiah, and even in Jeremiah, as I read, there are scriptures that announce the prophecy of this coming Redeemer, this birth of Jesus, who will be the Savior of the world. Here in Jeremiah's writing, this prophecy that Jeremiah is given says, in those days there was a time I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. And God is telling us that there's going to be a promise that is fulfilled. There will be a descendant of the line of David. There will be this new covenant promise that is fulfilled, this righteous branch. Isaiah 2, 4, 2, and Isaiah 11, 1, Jeremiah 23, 5, all talk about this righteous branch of David. Jeremiah may not have the same information or as much to say about this prophecy of the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, but Jeremiah does reveal that Christ is, is the fountain of living waters in Jeremiah 2.13. He is the good shepherd in Jeremiah 23.4 and 31.10. As I mentioned, the righteous branch in Jeremiah 23.5. He is the redeemer in Jeremiah 50.34. He is the Lord our righteousness in Jeremiah 23.6. And he is held as king in Jeremiah 39. And so while we often go back to Isaiah to hear about the suffering servant that will be born, Jeremiah tells us there's going to be a righteous branch. And this righteous branch is going to come. And in Jeremiah, and the reason that I chose this particular text this morning, is it gives us that book in. It tells us that there's going to be a righteous branch that is coming. But Jeremiah also says that there's going to be justice and there's going to be righteousness on the whole earth. And then in verse 16, he says, In those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell in safety. And this is the name by which she will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And you see, she in this case is Jerusalem, this second coming when Christ will restore everything and everything will be made right in the eyes of God. Jerusalem will be given this name, the Lord, our righteousness. And no longer will there be a place of idolatry, no longer rebellion or shame, no longer destruction but everything will be made right because of the Messiah who has come and will come again. You see, for us, the adventure with Christ has begun. With us, we claim him as Lord and Savior. With us who believe that Jesus was the Son of God who was born in Bethlehem, who lived and died and was raised to life again so that we may have life in him. We are on this journey with Jesus, this adventure in a lost world. It's not much different for Mary if you think about it. Mary's adventure up until the point of Gabriel coming, Mary was your, just your typical young teenager who was betrothed to Joseph. Think about it. 
We know that her father was Eli. We know that her sister was Salome. We know that she has a relative named Elizabeth. We know that she is, is young and poor. We know she lives in Nazareth. We also know something else about her. We know that Mary was in love. She was in love. She had a beau, Joseph, and they were planning to be married. In fact, the scripture tells us that they were betrothed or pledged to one another. And you've heard me say before that that period looks different than today as we see it. They were looked at as husband and wife during this time, that they were betrothed together, though they did not live together, no, nor did they consummate the marriage in any way. Mary would live with her father, Joseph would live with his parents until the time that the public wedding feasts would take place. But they were still considered husband and wife. And so Mary had to be that typical bride, right? She was planning. She was engaged. She knew what was coming. I mean, think of the excitement with Mary who was planning a wedding probably similar to what you would do today. Who's coming? What are we going to eat? How is this going to happen? Where is it going to happen? So she was excited. If you've been a bride, you get excited. Don't you? About what's to come? Her life, though, at the very point of one of the happiest, probably more, most blissful, just exciting times of her life. God intervened. <laughs> her adventure was about to change. It was going to take a, quit, a, a twist that she really never thought was going in her wildest dreams would ever happen because it was a mission impossible. In that moment, God broke in to this this young teenage girl, he comes to her with this unbel unbelievable statement that would forever change everything about her life. Gone would be the happy dreams of this blissful wedding. Gone would be the sweet anticipation Gone would be the plans of the wedding feast as she knew it. Gone would be the hopes of a beautiful wedding in a town with all gathered around celebrating her marriage. Gone. Oh, she would be married. She would be married. But the gossip through the countryside in town would be prevalent. There would be a wedding feast, but not as she had planned, not as she had expected. Because you see, in, in that moment, in all of history, in that moment, God's plan for her began. Gabriel comes into her presence and the scripture says, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. Man, how much information that God gives us in that sentence. And then again, the second time, and the virgin's name was Mary. These two verses give us a framework, a historical framework about what is about to happen. This is not a figment of someone's imagination. This is not a hallucination of someone that just wrote down, oh, I think this is the way it happened. Francis Schaeffer termed it as the true truth. And he went on to say, just as Mary was there in the presence of Gabriel, if you had been there, you would have experienced, you would have seen everything, heard everything, just as she had and did. It's not a hallucination. It's a fact. In these two verses, the fact comes to bear that she's a virgin. Twice, Gabriel says, 
that she is a virgin. Mary certainly had to be completely in the dark as Gabriel comes and interrupts her life. Mary was probably doing chores, and this stranger comes before her. Greetings, favored one. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Good news, right? Could you imagine that? Hey, good news. It's your lucky day, Mary. Guess what? You're going to have a baby. Oh, thank you. No, I mean, think about it. Would that be something you would be like, oh, my goodness. Wouldn't she have questions? Congratulations, Mary. You're going to have a baby. Gabriel blew her mind. That's a 20th century term, though, that I doubt that she said, hey, you're blowing my mind. That's a pretty good opener, I think. Gabriel didn't get much pushback in the sense of, wait a minute, I need some clarification. Um, um, I think uh, you need to leave now. I, I, I'm getting married. I haven't had any relations here. You know, come on, Gabriel. But, and you couldn't really blame Mary for those responses, but the fact is, is that as the scripture unfolds and as we hear this story, Mary didn't go down any path but one. The only path that she went down was given to us in a way to help us in the future understand the Christ child. You see, the only question that Mary asked was this, how can this be since I'm a virgin? How can this be? It's a perfectly right question. She had been betrothed to Joseph. She had known him, but no physical contact at all. And so, her question is, how is this going to happen? How can this be? I'm a virgin. And Gabriel says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. If anyone comes to you and says, I have problems with the virgin birth, there's nowhere really in Scripture that talks about that. There's really no understanding of where that comes from. Just go point them to Luke one thirty five. Verse 135 in Luke's gospel gives us the understanding, tells us how this is going to happen. Gabriel answers Mary's question. Answers her question. And here we see faith on Mary's behalf. Faith. Now, there are those today that will question the virgin birth. There are pastors in the pulpit today that do not believe that Jesus is more than just a good man, a good example, someone that we should follow, that God has chosen as the good example. And for anyone to believe that, and believe that Jesus is nothing more than the son of Joseph, then what you're saying is Jesus is nothing more than a mere man. And folks, a mere man can't save you. If 
if you do not believe in the virgin birth, there is no reason for you to say that you have faith or believe in Jesus Christ. There's absolutely no reason for that. But to believe that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and Mary conceived the Son of God, the very Son that would leave heaven and come down to earth and would be born in Bethlehem. Certainly, Mary still had some questions. Gabriel, nor God, made everything perfectly clear to Mary. But she was willing to believe. She believed in her God. She believed and submitted. She believed and submitted. I want you to keep those two words, believe and submitted, in your mind because you see this is exactly what God is calling us to do. Because you see, nothing is impossible with God. Mary might have had doubts. She might have had some concern, as we would think, and logically, we would think she would. But she had faith, and she submitted knowing that nothing is impossible with God. And Gabriel must have understood because with nothing impossible with God, he says to her, and I want to tell you something. You have a relative, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth is six months pregnant. And that is where in the sixth month in this text comes from as it starts in verse 26, that now in the sixth month the angel it is referring to Elizabeth being pregnant for six months, six months. And so Gabriel gives Mary an understanding that there is nothing impossible. Your, your relative is, you know, post, she's barren, she's in her 70s plus, and here she is going to have a child. You see, Mary, there's nothing impossible with God. Now, these two cases are similar but different. Different in the fact that Mary was a teenager and Elizabeth was older, barren. Elizabeth conceived the natural way. Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit. But Gabriel's point here was, Mary, what I want you to see is there's nothing that is impossible with God. All things are possible. I think sometimes we overlook that verse 37 as we're reading this story about Mary's engagement as this adventure for her began with Gabriel's presence as she is told that she's going to be the mother of the Christ child. I think so often we just bypass verse 37 that says, for nothing is impossible with God. Whatever deci God decides to do, he can do. Whatever de God decides that he wants to do, if it's a virgin that will conceive as Mary, God performed that miracle with her because it was his plan of salvation. It was his plan of redemption. And what he asked of her with simple faith. Luke makes it clear that Mary is real, her doubts are real, the very questions that she has certainly were real. But her simple faith is displayed in verse 38. For I am a servant of the Lord. I am a bondservant of God. And may it be so with me as you have said. May it be so. Mary said yes. Yes to God. Yes to the impossible. Yes to a plan, a deviation from what she had planned. Yes to the adventure that was before her. But man, would it bring changes in her life. 
there would be rumors and lies and sleepless nights for Mary. Because you see, the neighborhood would gossip, did you hear about Mary? Did you hear about Mary and Joseph? Did you hear that Mary is pregnant? The gossip around town would have flown rumors and lies and sleepless nights for her. Think about it. At this point, she had no idea how Joseph might respond. She didn't know what he knew or the Lord would have come to him. What she knew at this point was she actually, once Joseph found out that she was pregnant, could actually have her stoned. Or he could just put her aside and it would all be over with. Her whole life as she knew it would have been changed in a moment. Rumors and lies and sleepless nights were a part of her life. Because you see, the adventure did not stop with just the birth of Jesus. The adventure continued with her having to flee home, go to Egypt. The headaches, the heartaches continued. She saw uh, opposition. She was slandered. There was certainly some loneliness there that she would face because certainly there would be those that would forsake her. But the greatest pain that Mary would ever face in this adventure happen at the foot of a hill when she saw her son killed, crucified. Innocent son. Something a mother should never have to see. And all along, she believed All along, she was in submission to the one that had called her for a purpose. And you see, we must never forget, as we walk with Christ, as we walk this adventure with Christ, we must never, ever forget that nothing is impossible with God in our life. Does it mean that God is going to make everything perfect? Absolutely not. But what God calls us to is the same thing that he called Mary to. To believe and be faithful. To believe and to submit. The good news is this. As we walk with Christ, as we think back to Bethlehem, we see a Savior that was born. A Savior who came into this world to seek and save the lost. You see, over 2,000 years ago, that event that happened began and caused you, a believer, to begin this adventure with Christ. As he calls you to faith and to submission. It's good news. Emmanuel. Christ with us. We must never forget. Never forget. Because you see, I would dare say that this Christmas, this Advent season, is, and, and as we begin to celebrate and think about the coming of the Christ child in Bethlehem years ago, there will be those this very Christmas that will have loneliness and heartache. There will be those this Christmas that will have despair. There will be those that have this hopeless feeling inside of them. There will be those that are facing financial difficulties, those that may not have a job, those whose marriages are falling apart, those who are so lonely that they don't know what tomorrow will bring. You know, if all of those problems could be solved humanly, wouldn't we do it? 
if, if we had all of those problems, that we could just make a decision and all of those problems would go away, wouldn't we do it? But you see, with God, nothing is impossible. Does it mean that all of those things may shift into what is a glorious result? Not necessarily. But here's what happens. When we believe and we submit and understand that the impossible is possible with God, it is then when the hope, Bruce mentioned the hope, of Christ, our hope in Christ begins to bring about peace. Do you remember what Jeremiah said? That there would be safety, that there would be peace that would enter because of this righteous branch that would be born, this righteous branch that would come, Jesus. Oh, how we need to remember and never forget the Christ child. There is nothing impossible with God. So what does God want from us? God wants from us, this is what he wants. He wants us to be like Mary. He wants us to believe. He wants us to submit, even in the unlikely and uncertainty of this adventure. None of us know what tomorrow will bring. None of us. You've got a plan. That's great. I do too. But we must remember who we are walking with. What God wants from us is to believe and submit as Mary did. Do you remember what Jesus said before he ascended, before he left? As he was teaching his disciples, he said, I will not leave you alone. I will not leave you orphaned. I will be with you. I will be with you always, even to the end of the earth. I will be with you forever. And if you have faith in Jesus Christ, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to claim that. You need to have that hope in him, no matter what tomorrow will bring. And Mary had no clue. Here is Gabriel telling her that she's going to be pregnant with the very Son of God. And he's gone. Gabriel left. He didn't give her a one, two, three, four, five, and here's what's next. And Mary, I expect you to do this. And Joseph is going to be good, and everything's going to be fine. Mary, you're going to be the mother of Jesus. And the adventure began. If you are walking with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, believe and submit. And walk with him in the hope. No false hope. But the knowledge of the hope that he will do exactly what he has promised he will do. May it be so with you and I as we adventure through this life with Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your holy word. We thank you for the Christ child. As we begin today, this Advent season, heading down this road to celebrating the first coming of Christ, our Savior. Father, we understand that one day he will return. He will come back and claim his church Father, until then, may we believe and submit and walk with you in this adventure that you have called us to and claimed us as a part of the kingdom, the very kingdom of the living God. May it be so. Father, we pray this in your holy name. Amen.